Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, just to uh, remind everybody, uh, my name is Damien Rose and I organize the Bay Area Lecture Series. Um, and I'm delighted today to uh, present to you two of my mentors um, in education and psychiatry. Um, so I will uh, introduce both of them, even though they're sort of a, a two-part uh, presentation. And as always, I try to keep my introductions to under a minute. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Alan Louie. He will be presenting second. Um, so uh, uh, Alan trained at Harvard, Stanford, and Chicago. Uh, he has a postdoctoral fellowship in neuropsychopharmacology, uh, um, and uh, as he will speak to, has been quite involved in medical and residency education over the past uh, decade or more, and is currently the director uh, of education for the Stanford University um, School of Medicine. Um, um, he will be speaking second. Uh, I will now introduce Descartes Lee, who will be speaking first. Uh, Descartes, who many of you know very well, I know very well, uh, actually did his uh, medical school and residency training uh, here at UCSF. Um, and he's been on faculty now for as long as I can remember. Uh, still work very closely with Descartes, really enjoy the chance to share the educational mission. Um, and they're going to be speaking to sort of more general trends in medical student education and how sort of these two larger Bay Area medical schools from sort of north to south of the Bay have been trying to integrate, among other things, DEI and anti-racist principles into an ongoing competency-based framework. So with that, I will let Descartes take it away. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? And uh, I think we're going to start with a, a, a poll. And so just, you know, uh, all things change, right? Things change all the time. So the kind of the, uh, and, and by the way, Alan and I are going to be, thanks so much for the introduction, Damien. Alan and I are going to be speaking kind of inter at the same time interchangeably. And um, uh, and we're going to, we started off with, and this was Alan's idea. I think it was a brilliant idea. Start off with a little poll here. So, and imagine, I guess, I guess the question that, that starts the poll is, imagine that you, oh, we don't have any disclosures. Imagine that you were going to uh, adjust medical student education, right? You had a chance to, change medical student education. Which of the following trends do you believe should be of the greatest importance? Would that be A, discovery and research, B, leadership and entrepreneurship, C, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and D, mental health and wellness? So if you were to take um, charge of medical education, and this is, there's no right or wrong answer, let us know what you think would be the most important themes to follow up on if you had a chance to change the future of medical education. We got a little more than half the people. I'll give ten more seconds to any last minute people want to pull in. And what would you focus on if you could control medical student education? And a brief shout out here to Gina, who's helping us with this this great new setup, but rather complex here at the Pritzker Building. Okay, now uh, can I end the poll here? I'm going to share the results, and uh, you know it's a pretty big spread of these uh, different themes. And um, uh, it looks like uh, kind of diversity, equity, inclusion has been the most important one. Uh, and so uh, just super interesting. Uh, it's not that far off from, we, we didn't put any ones in here that were not part of the AAMC's strategic plan. So Al and I, in preparing for this Grand Rounds, we took a look at the AAMC, which is kind of the organize, organizing uh, 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 institution for medical schools across the United States and looked at their strategic plan. And they have a 10 item strategic plan, which you can see here in the, in the page with a lot of small, tiny fonts. So made it a little bit bigger, but still 10 items was too big for our presentation. So what Alan and I decided to do was condense it to four different items to organize this presentation for you. And so the four uh, pieces of the uh, strategic plan that we can kind of consolidate it into discovery and research, leadership and entrepreneurship, diversity, equity and inclusion, and mental health and wellness. These are the four areas that we're going to talk about today in um, medical student education. So um, it's actually, uh, uh, and we're going to alternate between the two. And we're going to try to compare and contrast how our two institutions are addressing these issues. Okay, so first, just a little bit of background here. Uh, and this is the outline of the talk. 
So let's just let's start with the background. And uh, let me introduce uh, Alan here and give him a chance to talk. Let's see if I can do this here. Whoops. Okay. Great, you're on, Alan. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be presenting here at UCSF with my colleague and friend, Descartes. Uh, this is a homecoming for me since, as some of you know, and I noticed some names on the Zoom I recognize. I had a wonderful career at UCSF for almost 30 years before moving to Stanford 10 years ago. So Descartes and I, uh, as he has introduced, will become compare and contrast the medical student curricula at Stanford and UCSF. And, you know, a disclaimer, however, is that I think Stanford and UCSF, like other major academic medical centers are for the most part similar. Uh, advancing medicine, caring for patients and populations, educating future physicians, much and much more. However, my personal experience has been that the cultures or personalities of these two schools are palpably different. And this affects how each is trending in medical education. So in some, while Descartes and I may magnify differences in the medical school curricula, please take this with a grain of salt. Uh, both schools delight in their outstanding graduates. The uh, difference, uh, differences we'll talk about may merely be in culture, which uh, nevertheless are important. Uh, they may determine which students and faculty may fit best at each school. So, you know, the entity that would become Stanford University School of Medicine was founded in San Francisco in 1858. Then the city had more than one medical school. But a defining year was 1959. Uh, the school elected to move to Palo Alto in order to be closer to the main campus to join research departments like biology, chemistry, engineering, et cetera. Uh, this was a clear prioritization of basic research in the medical school. Uh, we can imagine the disruption to clinical training, finding new patients and populations, new hospitals, local attendings. But now Stanford has two university hospitals, a VA hospital and county hospitals and community sites. Uh, importantly, but unknowingly at the time, this move positioned Stanford Medical School next to the yet to be born Silicon Valley, a name that would only be coined 12 years later and popularized in the 1980s. In the next slide, Descartes, uh, Stanford's medical education mission emphasizes the capacity to make discoveries and lead innovation. This reiterates the priority of research, uh, which spearheaded the move to Palo Alto and Silicon Valley. And in my view, Stanford's focus is on personalized education, uh, tailoring education to the learner's proximal zone of development and unique career trajectory. Uh, like a small liberal arts college, it touts attention to the individual. Thus, Stanford has a small medical school, about 90 students. Uh, we started to get up towards 100 and people were saying, oh, that's too big, too big. Students are expected to customize their learning by pursuing research years, joint degrees, entrepreneurial activities and the like. And this takes time, usually extra years. So the school has been moving towards a five plus year model with a minority of students finishing in four years. In keeping with the personalized education, the word most commonly associated with Stanford's medical school journey is flexibility. Over to you, Descartes. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, thank you, Alan, for that. And you have a big overview of, a good view of Stanford. Um, I think you have some good view of UCSF too, having me having taken over your roles in some of these areas. So you know what I know and you know a lot more about Stanford. But UCSF was um, one of the medical schools in San Francisco uh, that Alan was talking about. It was established as Poland Medical College in, in 1840, uh, 1864, and um, uh, became a then became the medical department of the University of California and part of the UC system. And it's the one UC uh, campus that's completely uh, dedicated to health science. There's a couple of other smaller programs within the bigger program uh, the San Joaquin Valley Prime Program, the Joint Medical Program, and other longitudinal programs. I won't go into them in great detail, but just so you know that they kind of do exist within our larger medical school. 
And uh, the, the, the mission at UCSF, the purpose of medical education is to educate leaders who improve the health of our communities and alleviate suffering due to illness and disease in our patients. So, you know, a very, very subtle difference with Stanford. And I think what I would add also is we definitely have a mandate to provide for the workforce of California, you know, the physician workforce of California. So um, that leads to uh, our class is about 160 per class. So significantly larger than Stanford. And we have a we had an overarching review of our curriculum a few years back called the Bridges Curriculum. So uh, you'll hear me refer to our curriculum as the Bridges Curriculum, uh, which was our, our newest iteration of the medical student education curriculum. Okay, that's okay. So we finished with the background. I think, again, both are pretty old uh, medical schools in the Bay Area, and um, uh, they're gonna, um, uh, and have similar backgrounds, but have changed subtly over the years. And our next topic is gonna to be research and discovery, and I'll let Alan take it from here. Okay, next slide, please, Descartes. So even though outstanding education is occurring in research and community health at both Stanford and UCSF, of note are the differences of their medical education mission statements. Uh, UCSF to educate learners who will improve the health of our communities and alleviate suffering due to illness and disease. Stanford to educate future physicians and foster their capacity to make discoveries and lead innovation. In keeping with this, Stanford named its latest curriculum reform of uh, 2017, the Discovery Curriculum, aimed at producing academic leaders. In the next slide, how does the Discovery Curriculum enhance the traditional curriculum? Uh, the traditional curriculum is shown here with the usual two years of pre-clerkship and two years of clerkships. At the end of the year two in the TAN block, time is carved out for either USMLE one study or early starting of clerkships with a delayed USMLE one. In the next slide, so that's the traditional curriculum. Flexibility is built into this curriculum by the option of expanding one of the pre-clerkship years into two years for a total of three pre-clerkship years. Thus, one year of material is a signed over two years. This uh, coursework then only fills 50% of that time, which leaves a balance of one year out of the two to pursue research. Uh, this is relatively new still, 20% of the students elect to do this. In the next slide, uh, here is just to show the weekday schedule of classes with the days of the week across the top, uh, shown for each quarter, for the three pre-clerkship uh, year option. Uh, you can see that about 50% of the time, the white blocks are quote unquote, open for discovery. Additionally, the summer between year two and three is open full time. Uh, in effect, these students are attending a five year medical school, including a year of research integrated into this. In order to defray the debt of an extra year, Stanford's Med Scholars Fund offers over 3 million dollars annually in competitive grants to the students. This funding is in addition to NIH funding uh, that supports the MD-PhD program. In the next slide, to summarize, um, you know, uh, most schools have a track for research or MSTP. Uh, the discovery curriculum attempts to build extra tracks on top of that, uh, each taking varying lengths of time towards a five plus year curriculum. Multiple paths allow for greater flexibility is the thinking of this. Everyone must complete a scholarly concentration, which is like a thesis or a project, which requires 12 units of coursework and one quarter of research. At graduation, only 25% of the class has actually spent only four years at Stanford. Uh, everyone else spends more than four years. Many of the five-year programs, uh, five-year people um, will do research far exceeding the scholarly concentration requirement, and they may obtain a master's degree in any field. Uh, those selected as Berg scholars, that pathway, receive special funding, fully covering six years of education and optionally a master's of science degree in biomedical investigation. Thus, uh, there are a number of pathways, including the one at the bottom, which is the uh, seven to eight year MD-PhD program. Over to you, Descartes. 
Okay. Well, I just want to make a little comment there. Compared to, I don't have a slide on this, but I think compared to UCSF students, about a little more than a third of them actually do take an extra year. So a lot of them do take five years to complete medical school. And as Al and I actually discussed in our preparation for this, you know, there had been some discussion of whether medical school is too long, because as Alan mentioned that as you make it longer, the greater the amount of student debt that the student comes out. And typically medical students can come out with two or $300,000 worth of debt, which then really affects the kind of specialty choices that they make. So, uh, so to talk about uh, getting back to UCSF in specific about what the curriculum is uh, about uh, research and innovation, uh, it's the part of the curriculum is called the inquiry curriculum. And the inquiry curriculum is designed to help students recognize the limits of current knowledge, engage in scientific discovery, and approach healthcare problems through various lenses from the six domains of science. And according to our website, it comprises about 30% of the total MD degree program. I haven't worked out how, how it breaks down exactly, but it, I think it does, it's a very significant portion of the medical degree program. Um, and the students often will do, and I'll talk about this in a minute, are, are encouraged to specialize at the end in one of these areas of science. And um, you can see that biomedical science is only one of six uh, potential options uh, that students can um, become uh, do research projects in. Although maybe a significant number of them, more than one six do it, but uh, other areas are encouraged as well. Um, so the inquiry curriculum is really kind of thought of as a lifelong process of, um, of uh, developing students. And the idea is actually to teach a habit of mind. Because of this, it takes place over the four year Bridges curriculum beginning on day one and culminating in an inquiry uh, symposium. Each step of the four year curriculum advances the learner first to a sophisticated consumer of biomedical science, then to a producer of new knowledge. So the idea of a habit of mind has to do with helping people develop, having students develop a uh, curious, logical, and skeptical mindset, uh, comfort with ambiguity that, uh, that medical science uh, is usually in, it seems to me, learning how to integrate information and applying it to new problems, and recognizing the limits of existing and one's own knowledge. So the idea is to go from a producer, a, a consumer of information to a producer of information. I won't go through all these specific steps here, but you can read them yourself. But it occurs, the, the, so we have the Bridges curriculum, then we have the inquiry curriculum, and then the inquiry curriculum is itself further subdivided into three phases with the core inquiry, inquiry immersion, and deep explore. And I'll just mention each of these quickly. The core inquiry is, you know, kind of the basic pre-medical student, pre-clinical medical student curriculum with cases, learning about epidemiology and biostatistics, and uh, participating in mini symposia. So getting a little taste of getting into something a little bit more uh, deep. Uh, so a mini symposium might be, for example, understanding a little bit more about psychosis. I think uh, Damien's run one of these mini symposiums himself uh, and say marijuana, for example, or THC, cannabis. So those are really interesting get, and designed to whet the student's appetite in various areas. The next phase is the inquiry immersion where there's more uh, mini courses, uh, exploration and community and, and skill building workshops. And the students at this point are also thought to decide, it's a two week piece of the curriculum, to decide what they want to do their deep explore, which is a, a capstone project. The deep explore is the development of a project, getting faculty mentorship and doing a, an independent project. And that uh, in the fourth year, it takes between 12 and 20 weeks of time. So you can see pretty significant chunk of time for the students. So I think we've compared and contrasted two different research and discovery aspects of our uh, institutions and both have a pretty big emphasis on that. Um, uh, so I, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Alan, did you want to add anything more to that or just go on to the next phase? Oh, let's, let's move on to uh, leadership and entrepreneurship. And uh, we're going to have a poll again. I think this is the most controversial we'll get during this uh, talk. So what percentage of each medical school class should be applicants? who do not plan to practice medicine or to enter a residency. In other words, applicants who know that they uh, do not want, that they want to get an MD, but they do not want to practice medicine. Uh, they don't plan to do an internship or residency. <clears throat> okay. I like to frame this as if you were to control 
medical student, medical education, what would your priorities be? Again, it's another one of those, how do we determine what we want our students to do? And by the way, if you have questions, Gina, and big shout out to Gina and Nick, by the way, for helping out and, and Manny um, for this, with this grand round. So if you have any questions, you put them in the chat. Is that correct, Gina? Or you can raise your hand, but if you want to just put them in the chat uh, so you don't forget, we may come back at the end. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat too. Okay, so it looks like 0% should be people who do not intend to practice medicine. Uh, that, that would be 20, 21% would say zero A is correct. Let's see, B was one to 5% of the class. And about half of you said that's, that's okay. And more than that, 10% uh, or greater, let's see, we have uh, about 20, 23%. Um, okay. Well, let's see, let's look at some data in the next slide. Uh, here are data from Stanford of the percentage of graduates who did not enter the National Residency Matching Program. And the average over these years uh, shown uh, is 5.6%. I believe that most of the people planned uh, to be entrepreneurs, frequently starting up a biomedical company. In the next slide, so about 5.6%. Six percent. So that was uh, within that. That was that. That fell within the uh, poll in terms of what most people thought might be acceptable. You know, all universities produce entrepreneurs, but Stanford seems to have made a specialty of this over the last few decades. Uh, here's a selection of well-known companies founded by Stanford alumni up to 2017 off of Wikipedia page. Uh, going back actually to after World War II, Fred Terman the Dean of Engineering and later Provost, supported students and faculty in launching their own startups and is credited by many for contributing to the birth of Silicon Valley. Currently, there are courses on entrepreneurship and even funding to assist Stanford College students in creating startup companies. Uh, I think they, they have to get them to take those courses early on in uh, college before they drop out to start the, their uh, company. In the next slide, Part of the entrepreneurial spirit is that the next great idea might require borrowing from some other field. So collaborations between disciplines, professions, and schools of the university are commonplace. They're encouraged. As a psychiatric educator, I have gotten ideas and advice applicable to medical education from faculty in the schools of uh, education, business, law, uh, for our uh, new forensic fellowship. Uh, Earth Sciences for a course on climate anxiety and from the humanities departments for medical humanities. So the school is highly enthusiastic about students getting joint degrees. 40% graduate with the MD and another advanced degree. In the next slide, so there's interprofessionalism. Um, that's part of the discovery curriculum. Um, part of the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit at Stanford is also design thinking. The curricular continuum shown here is between discovery and design. Now, this is totally my contrivance, so please don't uh, take this as Stanford gospel. The curriculum is the discovery curriculum, but I prefer to add a design tale on it because discovery does not have much impact if it remains sequestered in the scientific literature. Implementation of discoveries requires that it be designed or engineered to be used by humans. Then on the bottom of the slide is a rough analogy to the continuum for translational research. In the next slide, well, what is design thinking? Uh, at Stanford, we teach students design thinking as popularized by the Stanford Design School or the D School for short. There, uh, process is a five-step one of design thinking, beginning with empathizing with the user's needs, then defining the problem and brainstorming, followed by rapid development of prototypes, which are uh, quickly evaluated. Prototypes are only rough because this is an iterative process, cycling around and around, rapidly turning out many rough prototypes and improving on each. So this design thinking is quite prevalent in the culture of at Stanford, we even use design thinking in order to uh, reimagine our medical school curriculum. 
uh, in the next slide. Uh, so then subsequent steps involve dissemination and implementation, followed by population outcome studies and policy. So in some, Stanford has a long history of an entrepreneurial spirit, and this uh, is found in the medical school, and interprofessionalism and design thinking are often uh, part and parcel with this. Over to you, Descartes. Okay, well, so we're on the section of um, leadership, uh, and uh, I think UCSF's um, uh, uh, one of the major initiatives in this area has the development of the coaching program. Uh, I was one of the coaches, and I'll go into a little description of it in just a moment here. So coaches are uh, from all different uh, disciplines across the School of Medicine, and they function as kind of, uh, uh, there are 50 of them approximately, and they meet weekly with the medical students with a cohort of students, five to six students, uh, eight hours or one whole day per week for their preclinical year. So it really is a a uh, significant chunk of time, and each coach is supported at 0 0.20 FTE each. Um, and the, what the coaches do, we act as m mentors um, to the students. And uh, in some ways, I think this is our, it's UCSF's approach to helping the students develop leadership skills. Now, we, we not only teach leadership skills to the students as coaches, we also teach clinical skills and a whole bunch of other things. But one of the capstone things that we do is helping them with their health system improvement project. And, Alan, when you were talking about the design school, the students also use that kind of methodology, uh, typically very similar to the lean methodology and are taught explicit uh, methods and procedures for doing that um, so that they develop some of these leadership skills and systems changing skills uh, for the, uh, uh, as they become physicians. They also, uh, coaches are also very critical in this professional identity formation curriculum that um, Eric Hung, uh, who I'll talk about in a little minute here, uh, was also important. And uh, they assist, and the coaches also assist with career and academic advising. And I just point out, this is uh, Alyssa Peterson, myself, and uh, Peter Reste have been our psychiatry representatives of the coaching program. And as vice chair for education, I'll put in a plug of, it would be great if we could get more psychiatry coaches. So if anyone's interested in applying for this position, it's a lot of fun, uh, but uh, pretty busy, but it's a great chance to get to know some medical students really well. Uh, this is the uh, slide on the professional identity formation topics that have been, you know, basically started and created by uh, Dr. Eric Hung. Um, and these are some of the topics that are uh, addressed. Um, yeah, I'm going to that. And then, you know, when we do the self health systems improvement project with the students, we explicitly use an A3 format. So for those of you who are familiar with problem solving um, the methodology in industry, you're probably familiar with A3 and lean methodology. Um, so just uh, uh, interestingly, we both have, uh, both Stanford and UCSF have adopted the kind of the design thinking very similarly. And um, I think in, at UCSF, the leadership uh, program has really been part of the, uh, part of the responsibility of the coaching program, uh, which has been uh, as a very robust and, uh, program here at UCSF. Alan, back to you. Okay, next slide, please, Descartes. So as, uh, Dr. Damian Rose promised you, we have a module here on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like other schools, Stanford is engaged in major DEI initiatives. And this slide lists our new DEI curriculum that is threaded across the medical school years uh, and various organizations supporting minorities on campus in the medical school and uh, at the university in at large. However, how, how are we doing with the bottom line for many of us, increasing the percentage of underrepresented peoples in medicine on the next slide? This bar graph depicts the percentage of underrepresented minorities amongst Stanford medical students, which is in uh, yellow, and the AAMC benchmarks in teal. Uh, efforts since 2016 appear to be paying off. Uh, we uh, have had an increase in the number of underrepresented peoples in medicine, but we seem to be plateauing now, just under 25%. The whole university's student body is 28% underrepresented peoples. Um, and I think our 25% is actually a little behind the uh, UCSF percentage, but we'll wait till Descartes uh, reveals that. Um, in the next slide, so our psychiatry residency has made uh, additional efforts 
to recruit underrepresented minorities shown by the black line and has reached 40 to 50 percent of underrepresented minorities uh, in amongst residents in the last two years. Uh, I asked the head of our DEI for the residency how this has been accomplished and she credits attracting diverse applicants because they come and see that our residency environment promotes a sense of belonging for everyone, all types of diversity and intersectionality. Uh, in the next slide, indeed, belonging is a major initiative of our, of our department. And of course, uh, many medical schools are focusing on this, but uh, we have in particular, a belonging project at Stanford. Um, our department has been um, committed to enhancing belonging actually across the whole university for the 17,000 Stanford students, plus the faculty and the staff. So this is a project we've taken on. We believe that the sense of belonging has been shown important through empirical work. So there is some evidence base, uh, even in the context of adversity and trauma. And those in distress who feel thwarted belonging are especially vulnerable to poor outcomes. By promoting a sense of belonging through this project, we hope to better sustain and retain diversity. And by having a reputation for belonging, we anticipate attracting diverse people. Towards this end, we are using various social belonging interventions designed by uh, social psychologists at Stanford and that have already been published and shown to increase belonging, health, and GPAs in Stanford College students. Uh, <clears throat> in the next slide, we're very excited about REACH, R-E-A-C-H. Uh, this is supported by a very generous new $25 million anonymous donation to train leaders in health and race equity and social justice. This fund uh, will uh, help several projects, including scholarly concentration in health equity and social justice, clerkship uh, with the underserved uh, degree programs and health equity research. And I think importantly, funding will also be used to increase the diversity of students applying to medical school in the pipeline through a post-baccalaureate research program. With the same objective, to increase in the next slide, to increase the diversity of pipeline into medicine. Our psychiatry department has committed to educating students before medical school. On this slide uh, is our educational portfolio. Uh, yes, I know it's too hard to read. Each of our educational programs are shown here across the continuum of learners, and each program is represented by a gray box. Most departments of psychiatry, of course, focus on the traditional learners in the middle of the chart, medical students, residents, clinical and research fellows. But we have also been working on extending our reach to either side. On the left of the chart is education before medical school. To the right is clinical psychology, uh, CME and professional education. Uh, in the next slide, so across this continuum of learners, our department enrolled or registered uh, some 12,000 learners last year. Uh, this included 1,500 Stanford College students who took some course offered by our, depart our department during the year. From uh, We have about 50 faculty who teach those undergraduate courses, along with teaching their usual medical school uh, learners. And our summer clinical neuroscience program has a couple hundred students, including outreach to underserved high school students. So in sum, we feel that educating the pipeline going into our field, especially underserved students, is part of our department's educational work and contributes to efforts in DEI. Over to you, Descartes. Thank you, Alan. And whenever I think I feel like I'm dealing with too much uh, stuff in my work life, I feel good knowing that you're dealing with even more, Alan, I have to say. Um, oh, there's a question, there was a question in the chat just about, how did you define URM? Since that's a specific question and we're on this topic. How did, how did you define URM? Um, so URM would be uh, African American, uh, you know, Hispanic uh, uh, ethnicity and um, 
uh, Native um, Native American, Pacific Islander, uh, Alaskan Native, uh, those categories. So it would not include the usual Asian populations. Thank you. Okay, uh, so let me go on. So now um, at UCSF, we're very proud of our um, student uh, learner activism. Uh, here's a little a slide of our uh, White Coats for Black Lives Matter uh, that uh, started here at UCSF. Um, I would say that although we're really proud of our activism and our uh, DEI efforts, we also still were far from perfect. You know, as a as a triggering event, we had one of our courses. You know, students felt uh, expressed being harmed in the course in the sense of um, they felt like, and this is an article not just at UCSF but at other places as well. Students may often feel like um, that the instruction is uh, students of color feel like the instruction on social underpinnings and consequences of race are offloaded onto students sometimes. Uh, students may report feeling more emotionally exhausted and unrewarded um, for their work in some of this curriculum. So this triggered a, um, a review of our own curriculum. Um, and we started with a diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, and belonging program and has led to an anti-oppressive curriculum initiative as just one part of that. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there is a lot of stuff that's happening. And here's the website. I'll go into some of the details right here, actually. So this is our the total number of uh, enrollment by degree at UCSF. As a reminder, we're only a healthcare, uh, health sciences uh, campus. So uh, we don't have undergraduates, for example. And this is the breakdown of the different students. Uh, for, as of the fall of 2021, I don't have the prior history, but this is the breakdown of our uh, 639 medical students over four or five years. Um, uh, the male to female ratio, uh, black, uh, Asian, Hispanic, white, and multiracial. Um, and this is a slide if you want to look at the details that show you our progress since 2014. Uh, Alan also showed a slide of his residency training program, and I don't have a comparable slide about how our residency training program has done in terms of recruiting um, uh, underrepresented minority uh, students. Um, but I hope in the Q&A, and I'm gonna give a little prompt to Eric Hung, if you wouldn't mind at some point in the chat, or we'll get to you in the Q&A, if you could say a little bit about how we've done. I, I feel very proud about what Eric has done. So I'm gonna give him a minute to talk about, or think about what his answer might be, and maybe some of the numbers if he has a minute. But we'll get to that in a minute, a little bit later. So here's the anti-oppressive uh, curriculum initiative that started last year as a result of that triggering event, as I mentioned. Uh, again, I don't want to go into great detail, but just to show it's a really concerted effort that's meant to be uh, really thorough and ongoing through all parts of the curriculum, not just you know a lecture here or there, for example. Um, uh, this is the this is the leadership of our uh, anti-oppressive curriculum initiative. Uh, it's a, and a three, again I mentioned a three-year initiative. And the goal is really to integrate anti-oppressive content and processes throughout all elements and phases of the curriculum. And the aspiration is to better prepare graduates to combat oppression and advance health equity in local, national, and global communities. I'm very proud that we, the school has put in a lot of uh, effort and resources into this initiative. Uh, one, a, a piece of it, a, a really cool piece of it, has been this curricular review tool that's been developed under the leadership of Peter Reste, who's one of our faculty. So I'm super proud to. Uh, sorry, Peter, if I'm stealing your thunder a little bit. He, he gave a, a lecture on this topic a, a few months ago. I was really impressed. And you know, the principles of the initiative really is in the in the reviewing is to make sure that each teacher thinks about person-first language in their cases, uh, making sure that all students and not just students of color are require are, should be responding to specific prompts, and hoping that um, the teachers can go beyond individual and personal level risk factors, and helping the students focus both on not only the foundation and causes of oppression, but also the tools for managing and addressing it. And so here's an example, I just cut a little tiny pieces out of the curricular review tool. So those of you who are teachers and are managing curricula, this gives you a way of reviewing your own curriculum and saying, hey, am I using person first language? Are there, have I included patient cases? And if so, what have I said about them? Um, are there prompts or personal reflections and have I been inclusive with them? And uh, are there unspoken requirements for students to give prompts? And again, this is just a small piece, but it's really helpful as a cognitive tool. And again, the big shout out to Peter Resby for developing that. So I think uh, uh, both schools have been doing a lot in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you know, uh, 
Uh, and um, I'm very proud at UCSF we're trying to uh, I share a couple of little specific incidents, but it's clear to me that both Stanford and UCSF have some uh, put some big resources behind that. Alan? In the next slide, Descartes. Okay, we're gonna talk about mental health and wellness now. Right, like other medical schools, we have a wide range of programs for the mental health and well-being of our students. Uh, this uh, is not unusual um, at this point, thankfully. Uh, we have student leadership and representation <clears throat> with regards to these efforts, well-being events, and mental health and well-being uh, services. What uh, we have done, which is a, a bit different uh, in the next slide, is the establishment of a student mental health fellowship uh, that occurs after psychiatry residency. Our fellowship started in 2017. Uh, there have been only a dozen or so university mental health fellowships in the US. They've sort of come and gone uh, over time, but all together about a dozen. In fact, uh, during COVID, however, uh, most if not all of them stopped training fellows except for our fellowship. Uh, it offers a PGY-5 training for one year, and uh, we have, a, uh, have one fellow currently. The fellows provide clinical care and consultation. They serve on university committees and do scholarly work or research, uh, usually presenting a poster at the college mental health session at the APA national meeting. In the next slide, the Student Mental Health Fellowship is uh, one of our nine fellowships. Um, this has been one of my uh, uh, focuses since I've been at Stanford. Uh, when I arrived at Stanford, we had three fellowships, uh, and now we are uh, launching our ninth. Uh, but what I wanted to show in this context of setting up fellowships, this was perhaps uh, one of the hardest to establish. It took a number of years uh, to get it um, set up and, and fund it. Uh, part of this is that it's not an existing ACG ME approved fellowship. There's no alternate accreditation body. For instance, for neuropsychiatry, uh, that's not ACG ME approved, but it is approved by the uh, UCNS, is the uh, United Council of Neurological uh, Subspecialties for neuropsychiatry and behavioral neurology boards. So there's no alternate accreditation body and there's no national organization for college mental health that is providing a certification. So it falls in the category, sort of like interventional psychiatry at this point, uh, no actual board. And uh, even though other student mental health fellowships have existed, each fellowship has had its own set of requirements and curriculum and as yet we are to have sort of a national standard for this type of fellowship. Uh, in the next slide, the structure of our fellowship is somewhat different uh, compared to other student mental health fellowships that have existed. The most straightforward way to develop this type of fellowship might be to uh, expand the typical campus mental health rotation, which many residents residencies offer during general psychiatry training uh, and turn expand that type of rotation during the general residency into a whole year to be a PGY-5 fellowship. Uh, this is usually then funded by converting the, an entry-level staff psychiatrist position at the student mental health service uh, into the one-year fellowship stipend. And because the fellowship stipend is a little lower than the entry level staff salary, the balance of the funds support the supervisor's time and other expenses. Of course, this means that the fellow is obligated to see a heavy panel of uh, student patients at the campus mental health service, just like an entry level staff psychiatrist, uh, but with a little time freed up to you know, do scholarly work. Well, we wanted to expand beyond this model of training at the campus mental health service. So our fellow does work at our campus mental health service, um, but this is really a small percentage. They see many students and tr transitional age youth uh, at the medical center's psychiatric inpatient unit and outpatient clinics. 
So these are not part of the campus mental health service. They are part of you know, Stanford Healthcare uh, offered to the population, uh, which of course has many students and, and uh, many students who were at the campus mental health service are referred over because their uh, coverage uh, has run out or their coverage does not cover inpatient. Um, so then they go on their regular health insurance and, and, and they're then seen by our fellow um, in Stanford Health Care. Uh, but this allows the fellow to be someone who can facilitate the smooth transfer from the health service uh, to the hospital uh, pro to provide continuity of care and then eventual transfer back to the campus mental health service. We also provide time for the fellow to be involved in relevant campus outreach, uh, for instance, to the dorms, uh, to be involved in well-being programs across the campus and sitting on various university committees. So in conclusion, our fellow gets to do a lot more than just seeing patients at the campus mental health service, and we're hoping that they can become leaders in this uh, field. Over to you, Descartes. Hey, that's really intriguing. So uh, yeah, just as background, you know, uh, this is, physician wellness has been prioritized and just wanted to mention again that, you know, really having physician wellness is really a necessary factor for quality patient care. Uh, it's required for effective healthcare organizations. And it's a systems issue as much as a personal one. If you're interested on the charter of physician well-being, here's a, here's a little reference for you. Um, and it's it's actually partly covered in what I mentioned earlier that was Eric Hung's uh, professional identity uh, formation uh, or professional identity development curriculum. Um, and uh, there's a, a bunch of different initiatives to think about how best to approach this problem as a, a way of being. And here are a couple other references. Now, um, I was part of a, uh, I co-chaired with uh, Louisa Thomas, a suicide prevention action group in 2021 in response to um, uh, medical student suicide. Uh, and this was charged by Catherine Lucy, who's the executive vice dean for the School of Medicine and the vice dean for education. And one of the things we discovered, and these next couple slides just come from our report really, is that you know wellness and healthcare uh, and mental health care for trainees at UCSF really is a hodgepodge of different places that um, give uh, can provide these services. So uh, I'll just highlight a couple of the main one is the Student Health and Counseling Center. Um, and then there's a smaller one just for medical students that's a medical student well-being program. And then our department of psychiatry had a COPE program, which is specifically during the um, uh, COVID uh, pandemic uh, crisis. We had our, our own hotline uh, for patients to come into our program. And then there's the faculty and student assistance program, which is more, more like a traditional EAP, which covers uh, not the medical students, but covers a lot of the other trainees like postdocs and residents who you know, form a very large part. So what we have is a huge like potpourri of different kinds of services, service organizations that are providing different kinds of services. Um, and so, again, I don't want to get into detail on this slide, but this is a graphic showing all the different factors that go into mental health and, and uh, uh, suicide prevention. So we do have a wellness uh, and mental health committee, which is co-chaired by my colleague or our colleague, uh, Q Chang Lee. And that really is uh, formulated to address broad school-wide medical student mental health and wellness issues. And they develop recommendations for mental health programming and interventions in response to mental health and wellness data and address systemic barriers students face in receiving uh, mental health care. And uh, these, this committee reports to the Associate Dean of Students who is going to be uh, Eric Hung in a couple of weeks, uh, just so you get the lay of the land. And Eric is currently our residency training program director, but he's gonna be moving on to this uh, position as Associate Dean of Students. And, uh, and so just to get back to what students face, one of the key barriers has been lack of awareness of resources available. Um, and so as I showed you in a couple of slides earlier that there are a lot of resources that students have, but they're like very confusing for the typical student to figure out which ones to get a hold of. So in response to that, there's actually been a couple of things that have been developed. One is just a, a PDF for students looking at the, the showing different types of um, programs that are available. There's the Medical Student Wellbeing Program. There's the Ginger Program, which allows, which is online and allows free unlimited access to mental health coaching, but not necessarily 
psychiatrists, but coaching. Um, and then 40% uh, uh, of the providers identify as um, uh, therapists of color. So uh, that's very important for our, our diverse student population. There's a med peers program. So these are medical students who function as peer supports. There's our student counseling services. And there's another thing called care advocacy. So after um, uh, interpersonal violence, there's a free confidential support for that. Uh, furthermore, they developed this really cool app, and I can't show it to you exactly how to do it on uh, on this PowerPoint, but uh, there's the QR code, and I'll just look through a couple of the screenshots that I have it. Uh, Howard Rubin is well known to us as in our department as a psychiatrist who leads the medical student well-being program. There's uh, these other resources. Um, I'm just going to click through the app here just to show you that they've done a wonderful job developing this thing, uh, very comprehensive. Okay, so that's really that winds it up. We just that's, uh, just to talk a little bit about our mental health wellness uh, uh, theme here in our presentation. And just to summarize, we talked about our background. We talked about how Stanford and UCSF both are interested in research and discovery. Um, uh, many of the students at Stanford actually take uh, an extra year to do research. We have an inquiry curriculum here at UCSF. Uh, leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, certainly, at Stanford is you know almost synonymous with Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship. At our site, we have a coaching program which provides mentorship uh, for the students on a really close one-to-one -one basis. And by the, another plug-in, we need more psychiatry coaches. Um, we have both have strong themes and resources for diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, uh, we have the anti-oppressive curriculum initiative at UCSF. And finally, mental health and wellness is a big theme throughout all education uh, and medical school is not uh, exempt from that. And uh, I think one of the things is we are have resources, but they're really crazily, I shouldn't say crazily, that's too pejorative, but they're very, uh, you know, Bit here and there, everyone's trying to do a good job, but they're not coordinated that well. And so there have been efforts made to coordinate them some more. So let me stop there and see if we have questions that come up. Uh, oh, and I also mentioned to Eric that I'd like to get the numbers on the kind of what kinds of students were able to admit, uh, get accepted to our um, residency training program. Eric, are you there? All right, any other questions? So it looks like we have one in the chat. Um, so I, I can read it if you can't see it. So it says, uh, you, you've both spoken to the trend of lengthening medical education. And while this has certain advantages, there's an obvious tension. You, you mentioned a little bit of this as sort of training more clinicians. Um, and so there's a countervailing train typified by some of these accelerated uh, uh, MD programs. Um, and so just uh, was curious if you had sort of uh, comments on that or thinking about what sort of the ideal average time spent uh, training a doctor, whether whether going up or going down or staying at, at, at roughly four. Um, just any comments on that? Alan, do you want to take a stab first and then I'll go or should we go the other way around? Right. Well, certainly. Stanford has decided to, to go with this five plus model. And again, only 25% of the graduating class have spent four years. Everyone else has spent more than four years and to encourage these you know, joint degrees. But I, I think certainly it views that uh, model as, as just something that Stanford can contribute uh, and has the resources to, to do that. Um, notably uh, resources in terms of an uh, funds that will uh, really pay the tuition for the additional years for the students so they don't incur additional uh, debt. I, I believe um, people graduating from Stanford Medical School uh, have uh, amongst the lowest uh, debt compared to other medical schools. So we, we certainly don't think that that's a you know solution that, that all medical schools should should do that, and um, we really need to increase our, our workforce, yeah. Um. So when we first, uh, for, and I was involved in the initial formulation of the Bridges curriculum, we did try to, think, try to think about how could we make this curriculum be doable in three years to try to decrease the amount of time a person spends in training before going into practice, as well as, you know, there's a lot of debt involved with 
um, medical school, as you know. Uh, however, if when we looked at that and we really tried to make it work, what happens is the person cannot apply to residency training programs in time uh, for it just to be a three-year program. There's no way you can get like letters of reference and get all the clinical stuff done um, in this area before uh, you want to apply for residency. So that's why we kind of had to stick with the four-year program. Now, as I mentioned, about 30% of the students do do extra year projects at UCSF or more than 30%, I believe. And a lot of that is funded. There's a, there's a great deal, there's a significant fund for one year research projects for medical students, which many apply for and are able to do special projects and therefore will take an extra year of medical school. Um, so their, their debt does not necessarily get enlarged because they take an extra year. Um, yeah, so I think that would be, that's kind of the countervailing force. And one of the reasons why I think you know, obviously students are interested and curious and want to do uh, some really interesting research and stuff. But I think part of it also has to do with the competitiveness of residency training programs that some of the specialty uh, students may feel like they have to do some sort of research for one year in that area in order to be competitive applicants as a res uh, for residency in that area. And uh, that's, you know, that's another area for debate about how competitive these residency training programs are or should be. Like, you know, if you're going to be a, a, in a certain specialty, do you need to have an extra year of you know basic science research in order to be a good applicant? But that's that's another topic. Yeah, well, I think those are uh, excellent points, uh, Descartes, because I I tend to think there's a problem with making our medical education too long. Also, you know, besides the debt, uh, besides also you're referring to sort of this race now for residencies and having longer and longer CVs in order to get into a residency. But, you know, just the time uh, and the age of the learner, um, you know, how many people entering our medical schools have already taken off time to do post doc years or to do research and just to get into medical school. And then, uh, you know, then you extend the medical school and then there are fellowships and so on. So that uh, what is the age of our workforce by, time, by the time it actually starts working? Um, and so I think our millennials and Gen Z are, you know, extending their training. Um, and then there's actually less time to practice medicine. Um, so I think there's some questions here in the chat. Uh, yeah, we're, we're winding down. And so it sounds like there's just a minute or two left. So maybe I'll condense the two questions into one, because it sounds like mental health and wellness was a big part of your presentation, integrating that in general into medical student education. And sort of two questions that come out of that are sort of thinking specifically about the role of us in promoting biopsychosocial formulation, as well as promoting actual physician wellness as opposed to uh, mental health per se. Mm -hmm. Well, at Stanford, with this belonging project, uh, there's uh, th that has sort of introduced um, a uh, a critical mass of faculty who are looking at wellness, uh, belonging, you know, preventive measures, and uh, and addressing you know Marty's question here about is the biopsychosocial formulation still alive in medical education then. And we hope so very much. Um, you know, Stanford has had a long tradition of uh, very basic medical research, but I think our department is quite balanced in sort of academic freedom and encouraging, you know, people doing research in psychotherapy and community work and and so on. So very much in our residency, uh, biopsychosocial formulation, teaching of psychotherapy, uh, my opinion is uh, very important that that's still alive. Um, and also teaching about social interventions and uh, DEI cultural issues. Um, I see Francis Liu on the call uh, with that. I think culture, cultural psychiatry is um, fortunately still alive at, uh, in our curriculum. <clears throat> um, and so with this commitment of our department to increase um, belonging across the campus, we have um, been drawn into looking at wellness and um, um, prevention. Descartes? Uh, I got it. just the last couple of comments here. Just totally agree with everyone saying it's so important. And, you know, uh, I think in the, in the realm of medical student education, psychiatry can't be the only uh, holders of wellness or 
you know, social factors in patient welfare. On the other hand, we do offer, uh, I think, important insight and perspective on this. But um, so in general, in terms of curriculum, we have to be out there and really pushing forward what we know and our expertise. And that probably has to happen a little bit more on almost an individual level in the sense of, you know, departments are not necessarily going to say, oh, we need psychiatrists for here and this for this. We need to kind of show up at these places and say, hey, this is the kind of things I'm interested in, these kinds of things I do, and be there uh, at that level. So we can't just sit back and hopefully people will call us kind of thing. Okay, we should wrap up here. Uh, Damien, any last? No, I just want to, I, I, we're at time. I know folks have places to be, but thank you so much, Alan and Descartes. I really learned a lot and I really appreciate this perspective on medical education on both sides of the bay. Take care all. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and uh, good to see colleagues at UCSF.